Welcome to the Gamification Report, Episode 6. I hope that you've had a fabulous week. We've had a fabulous week here getting the show ready for you. This week we're going to look at gamification and combat training. We're going to look at serious and non-serious games. What we call a non-serious serious games. What could that be? Let's find out. We're going to talk about cloud-based games for learning how to run a business, emotional learning and virtual reality, and mixed reality and learning styles. Let's get started. Combat Gamification. This is a paper published by Jerome Plachon in 2018, and he comes from France, where they have discovered that almost 25% of combat-related deaths are considered preventable if life-saving interventions are performed. Therefore, they, uh, they discuss this in terms of tactical combat casualty care, and it's a major challenge. So they started to take their basic training, and they supplemented with a system called 3DSC1, and they found uh, that... Uh, they also could uh, compare that to using a DVD. So you're either in a VR combat situation or you're watching the simulation on, on a disc. And they found that when they compared them to, there were no significant difference between the effects of the training tools. This is what the VR, a kind of a screen capture from what the VR uh, experience would give you. So they had a whole kind of randomization. They did this in the form of a proper trial uh, in which they had a number of voluntary military personnel and uh, they put them to the different scenarios and then uh, these scenarios were compared when they taught them with either a DVD or the immersive environment. And uh, they found that, uh, that they were almost uh, identical here. Um, and then Pasquier started to publish again from France, looking at in the work in 2016. Looked at scenarios, uh, which is based on an attack of attack on a patrol of three soldiers using an IED, an explosive device. One soldier dies. One soldier was slightly stunned, and the so third soldier experiences a leg amputation and other injuries. So they tested it in mannequins, uh, mannequins in military simulation centers first, and then they c created a virtual 3D real-time scenario. Uh, so then they add different levels of difficulty to put it together. And uh, so this simulates much more the type of thing that you're, you're to see in combat uh, situations. So again, to review that, it does not appear that this virtual reality environment differs in terms of its outcome uh, for actual competence uh, compared to a DVD. It's, it's much more immersive, and, and we'll look in future broadcasts at the role of immersion and learning, but in this case, there were not great comparable differences between the two. We've seen this data come up before that well-designed DVD um, multimedia presentations seem to equal VR in their output. Next, let's have a look at non-serious, serious games. Whatever could that be? Matthew Hudson at the Toshiba Design Center in 2016 looked at the idea that games can be a setting for improved social well-being, second language learning, and the developments of uh, treating things like fear of public speaking. So non-serious, serious games are games which are playful in design. They're imaginative, but they're not focused on the real world. They're focused on fantasy worlds. And so they developed a lot of clans uh, that then had to work through problem-solving scenarios in these games. And the game improved comfort with assuming leadership roles, responsibility, confidence, and problem-solving. So instead of teaching someone leadership, game systems to impart concepts on the periphery of leadership. So I would urge you all, when you're designing serious games, to not make them too serious, but to keep that element of fantasy, because that allows people to explore a lot of other learning aspects. We don't have to build specific learning content to a game per se. We simply have to place players in a situation in the game that demonstrates the same skills that work as well. So you might not have to actually emulate working in a hospital in a game. You could have them working in a virtual uh, game world where they have to heal fallen elves or tauren bulls. And they, if, as long as they're using the same identical skills as they would in the workplace, the fantasy transfers over very well. We're going to look at entrepreneurship in serious games. This is the work of Fernando Almeida, January 2017, published. And essentially, he developed a cloud-based serious game about entrepreneurship. Entrepreneurship is a big problem. Uh, we're going to get to it in Broadcast 8. We're going to talk a little bit more about entrepreneurship uh, games and, and training and education. So essentially, what he let them do is build a game with different eight levels with different floors. And they could move through these different floors as they progressed in their gameplay. So for example, they had uh, recreation 
recreation floor. So at that floor, users could watch videos, play leisure games, get contacts in starting a business, learn how to use LinkedIn, marketing, taxes, and finance. Then they could enter a lift station where they could fill the entrepreneurial profile questionnaire. You had a virtual market in which you could simulate a business in a virtual market and be able to sell your goods in that market. And this led to uh, chat functions, which offered the possibility to interact, uh, interact with other users, and a top list of the best games using a leaderboard. So again, entrepreneurship is a big area, and we've done a lot of work in, in developing these synthetic uh, spaces uh, <clears throat> where you create a three-dimensional structure like a building, and in that building there are many areas. We have a project now where we have an area called the Imaginarium, and it's a virtual clinical environment where there's four different wards you can explore to try cases in, in, in geriatric and gerontological medicine. And when you get stuck in a case, you can go to the Imaginarium, you can access core learning materials, uh, you can write a little quiz in that area, get some experience points and gain some in-game currency, and then go back and purchase elements that help you solve the case. So the idea is that when you build games, if you create a real environment, and they did this in this case as well, buy low, sell high, play long, that seems to be the message here in good entrepreneurship training. We're then going to look at the idea of how you develop these virtual learning environments that we're talking about, because I think you're probably interested in the kind of things I've just spoken about in our virtual hospital simulation and what we've seen previously. So Judith Mulco Danielson in 2016 published some research that stemmed from a three-year funded network project called Euroversity, and it had 18 partners with foreign language instructors and educators across Europe, and they tried to develop the idea of immersive learning experiences and environments. And what was really interesting is they developed this concept here called an epistemic game. So an epistemic game is a game that relates the gameplay objectives and constructs uh, and knowledge to investigate effective learning in a three-dimensional three virtual learning environment. So essentially this was an alien mystery unfolding in a virtual village called Chatterdale in a multi-user uh, virtual learning environments. And so we see these, these kind of virtual environments occur. This is a scene from World of Warcraft, as most of our graphics are imported from today. So the students aim to solve various mysteries. And so they were able to, by working in a virtual learning environment, improve their self-efficacy. They enhanced their oral skills and in interacting. They had effective learning, and that had to do with their own emotional experience with the task. And the play was based on your personal interest, and they didn't experience any test anxiety. So when you create a virtual hospital or a virtual business or a virtual city and, and, the, and the player can travel around the city. Again, this doesn't have to be in 3D. All this has to be is some kind of conceptual. You could do it on paper. You, you can do it in a board game. You can do it with a rule set. When you're actually navigating through a city and students have a lot of agency, we see increases in all of these different dimensions that occur. Rather than giving them a silly little mini game, which can be fun, but is not that effective in building these higher level skills. We're then going to take a look now at augmented reality, virtual reality, and effect on learning styles. And this is a big area. We're going to try to summarize a little bit of it. Talanka Chandraskira from the Oklahoma State University and uh, So Yeun from Cornell University collaborated to look at how we put learning styles and virtual reality and augmented reality together. Now, learning styles, it's a big area we want to look at. There are about 10 different student learning style inventories in the top 100. One of them has 65 items. One of them has something like 18 ADA items. And the Kolb's learning style inventory was something we learned about many years ago. But learning styles is really on the fence right now. And I think the question we want to ask more than assigning people to a specific learning style and keeping them there for life, you're a visual learner, you know that's what you are. I think there's better ways to look at that, and that is that we adapt the virtual and augmented reality to the way people like to learn, but learning styles take on a different terminology. They have these different uh, uh, you know, hypotheses that they, they tested. One of them is the interface in what's called perceived ease, ease of use. So when someone begins to use VR, uh, how do they perceive it to be easy? Do they put the goggles on, or do they then have to type and enter passwords and go to websites and grab their camera and download it, then take it off and do a quiz? That's perceived ease of use of learning. This perceived usefulness of learning was the second hypothesis they looked at. That is how much bang for the buck do you think you're going to get through the VR learning. And then the type of inter interface that they use, which is the intention to use. We have this VR, are you going to use it or not? 
They looked at other hypotheses, the learner preference of the user moderating the PEU, etc. And so we have all of these different things that come together. You can freeze frame it and look at these if you need. But the basic idea here is that learner generated, I love these moves, learner generated movement when somebody really sees that something is easy to use, that they have an intended use for it that they need to fulfill, and they have the perceived desire to interact with the VR are going to be the determinants of success much more than what you show in the VR itself. Most of the studies showed that augmented reality, as you could imagine, was easier and better for most learners to use. Uh, people perceive a augmented reality to be easy to use. You look on your cell phone and it shows you something that's in a wall. VR involves putting goggles on, you're tethered, you're attached to a device, you have to strap and unstrap. So basically, uh, kinesthetic learners, when they broke them up, people that learn by feeling, found that the air environment much more useful than VR environment. But visual learners, people that like to learn by seeing, which this generation often is uh, quoted as having high levels of, found the augmented, reali uh, uh, augmented reality more useful than the VR environment. So there are some elements in which augmented reality and virtual reality are going to connect with different types of learners, whichever learning style inventory you pry to use. However, the strongest kicks were seen in the perceived usefulness and perceived ease of use and intention to use. Very strong in AR versus ER interfaces. Another success for the field. That's it for this week. We'll see you next time. Next time. Next time.